Well, so uh, thank you everybody here. And uh, thank you for to uh, Professor Hussein for accepting our invitation to be our last, uh, uh, I mean, latest speaker at the EC Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, just before letting Professor Hussein start, uh, I'm gonna tell a couple of words about his, uh, his background. Uh, so Mahmoud Hussein is currently the Alva and Harriet Obley Professor in the Smith Department of Aerospace Engineering Sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, at the same time, he also has a courtesy appointment to the Department of Physics and uh, he's an affiliate uh, of the Department of Applied Mathematics at the same university. Uh, additionally, I see you Boulder, uh, is the director of the pre-engineering program at the College of Engineering at Applied Science, and is also the director of the phononics laboratory. Um, uh, Dr. Hussein received his bachelor's degree from the American University in Cairo, and uh, his master's degrees from both Imperial College in London and University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. In uh, 2004, he earned uh, his PhD from the University of Michigan, and uh, completed a postdoc at the University of Cambridge between 2005 and 2007. In 2011, Dr. Hussein received the prestigious DARPA Young Faculty Award, and in 2013, also the NSF Career Award. In 2017, he also received the Provost Faculty Achievement Award for tenure faculty at CU Boulder. Uh, Dr. Hussein is a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and uh, the founding vice president of the International Phononics Society. He also uh, co-established the Phononics Conference Series, uh, which is widely viewed as the world's premier event in the emerging field of phononics. Dr. Hussein's research interests lie broadly in the fields of phononics and nonlinear wave propagation. So with that, uh, today is gonna talk about a uh, large scale vibrant phonon couplings and a new strategy in thermoelectricity. So again, uh, Professor Hussein, thank you very much for accepting my invitation to, to be here today. And uh, you can start uh, whenever you want. All right, so thank you so much, Alessandro. It's, it's really a pleasure to, to get this invitation from you uh, to virtually visit uh, Rice uh, and uh, you know, get the chance to uh, meet some of the faculty. So uh, I met a couple of uh, folks uh, this morning, and I'm looking forward to having more meetings. Um, so I want to, today I'm going to talk about um, a concept uh, that uh, we've put forward a, a few years ago um, that essentially um, utilizes uh, uh, at the core of the, of the idea, utilization of wave phenomena, including uh, resonances towards uh, controlling thermal transport at the nanoscale and consequently uh, controlling um, thermoelectricity. Um, in fact, this is uh, an idea that uh, comes to shape by nanostructuring. So we, we, we call it a nanophononic metamaterial. And uh, as you mentioned in, in the title, we have the, the phrase here, large scale of specifically vibron phonon couplings. So of course, phonons are entities that, that carry heat and typically in a, in, a, in, the, in a semiconductor, that's the context we're, we're talking about here. Um, and vibrons, uh, while they're also phonons, but they're different, uh, instead of carrying heat, they serve another purpose. So this is this notion of vibron phonon coupling is really at the heart of what I'll talk about today. And I'll be uh, spending pretty much mo uh, most of the talk uh, going through the details, the modeling, the details, the physical phenomena, and how it actually gives us this uh, uh, favorable effect. But before I start, I want to just take a minute to uh, acknowledge Three important people, uh, my, my PhD students throughout throughout the journey that we've taken in, in, in this research, uh, starting with Bruce Davis, who's now uh, who works um, at the Rokar, which is a space company in Colorado. Hossein Honorvar, who picked up from Bruce, and he is now a postdoc in Mount Sinai uh, Research Institute in, in New York. And then my current PhD student Chow Chow Nin Sai, uh, who's a who's a fifth year PhD student right now. And I, I'd like to also thank NSF and RPE for, for their support. Okay, so it's not really very hard to motivate thermoelectrics um, because, you know, from a broad perspective, if we look at um, energy generation, power generation, 
energy produced in all sorts of vehicles and so on, um, there, there are statistics that tells us that roughly 60% of that energy is uh, wasted. So um, any type of energy conversion technology uh, or advances, I should say, in energy conversion, including thermoelectrics, uh, that would help us reduce this amount of wasted heat would be of tremendous use. So uh, focusing uh, on, on, on thermoelectrics specifically, uh, this is, of course, um, I'm sure a lot of audience today are familiar with the concept, but I'll introduce it briefly. Um, it, it, it's been around for over 200 years now. It's uh, essentially, it's a, a phenomenon that takes place in the steady state. So if we consider uh, a, a hot uh, junction and a cold junction and place a thermoelectric material between those two junctions, usually at a semiconductor, then uh, essentially because of that temperature gradient, uh, we will get uh, a migration, thermal migration of charge from the hot to, to the cold. Now, as the charge uh, adds up, it starts repelling each other. So you get uh, transport in the reverse direction, you get charge transport induced by electrostatic forces. So these two effects balance and the, in the steady state, you essentially get an electric current and if you so if you connect the if you if you connect uh, by wire you 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 you're able to generate electricity. It's uh, been developed and used. It's commercially available right now in the form of a of a device, usually a flat looking device, as, as shown there on the right. Um, and as one would imagine, uh, a key aspect of it, of course, is how well it performs. So the efficiency of the device and uh, inside the device, uh, how does the thermoelectric material itself perform? So there's a figure of merit that describes that, uh, what is known as the ZT figure of merit. And it's basically, uh, in the, it, it's a numerator divided by a denominator. In the denominator, you've got the thermal, conducti uh, thermal conductivity. And then on the top, you've got a power, uh, a, pro a product between the Seebeck coefficient squared and the electrical conductivity. So the Seebeck coefficient is a measure of, uh, the ability of a material to generate charge in the presence of a temperature gradient. And then of course, sigma and K, and K are the measures of electrical and thermal conductivity. So clearly you can see here, and this has been one of the, you know, the challenges of thermoelectrics is that um, properties tend to go together, transport properties. So uh, for example, in metals, they're, they're good conductors of heat and, and electricity. Polymers are opposite. So it's really hard to, this, to uncouple those, those effects. And in fact, there's this uh, term or phrase uh, whereby uh, it is said that the target is to get a, uh, a material that behaves like a crystal when it comes to electrons, but behaves as a glass when it comes to quantum. So this is really has been the challenge uh, for improving this uh, ZT figure of merit. So, um, so we're going to uh, focus on the denominator part for the most part, the, the thermal uh, transport. And underlying that at, at, at the most basic level is phonons. So if we take a strip there uh, in that material, we, we recognize that, uh, that that strip admits phonons, which of course are uh, quantized atomic vibrations. Uh, in, 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 in the context of this talk, I'll, I'll be view, viewing them mostly as, as waves. Um, and these waves are play a, a very important role in, uh, in contributing to the definition of the very definition of thermal conductivity. However, the wave picture is not sufficient because thermal transport also involves scattering events. These are widely utilized, uh, in fact, to, to, to reduce the thermal conductivity. So a lot of work has been uh, done over the years, especially the last two decades with the advent of uh, nanotechnology to specifically use the notion of scattering very uh, intelligently to reduce the thermal conductivity. And of course, try to do that without affecting the electronic properties. So I'm gonna just uh, show, show uh, an example uh, paper here that has a uh, very, very interesting paper that has been very well received and uh, since 2012. This paper um, targets that, uh, that idea, that, that sort of strategy whereby you can reduce the thermal conductivity and you can do it at different scales. So. At the atomic scale, you can take uh, 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 some, some crystalline material, let, let, let telluride, for example, and, and introduce uh, sodium in, in impurities. And in doing so, you effectively uh, scatter some of the phonons of certain, certain length scales. 
So if you look at this figure at the bottom, it's a figure of merit versus temperature. And you can see you can go quite quite high just by adding these uh, impurities or these uh, alloying elements. Then you take another step and add uh, inclusions at larger scale. And they've shown here through their experiments that you can go up further to perhaps a ZP of on the order of 1.7. And then even further uh, by, by introducing some uh, polycrystalline uh, microstructure with grains, they've shown that at high temperatures, you can reach uh, you know, ZT above two, which is, which is quite a high, uh, high value. Uh, so again, this is, this is uh, to put it in the context of the, of the ZT expression, these uh, obstacles of different scales, they, they do a good job in reducing the thermal conductivity, but at the same time, they also uh, block the electrons. So in a way, that's, that's the, the key challenge. So to put things in context, uh, as far as commercial uh, thermoelectric devices are concerned, they tend to be uh, hovering around uh, that green region. So the performance tends to be limited by, by roughly one. And these are a few examples. They, each type tends to peak at a certain temperature. So you've got bismuth telluride, for example, lead telluride, silicon germanium at high temperatures, and so on. So, um, and it's, it's also interesting to, to uh, sort of like in this picture to see uh, what if we uh, look at a very common material like silicon, let's say. So it, 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 it would be intriguing to, to see if silicon can uh, be used as a, as a base material for thermoelectricity, because of course it's very abundant and uh, it has, it's been widely used in the electronic industry, has good mechanical properties and so on. However, as you can see, unfortunately, uh, it, it actually performs very poorly as a thermoelectric material, roughly on the order of 0 0.01 uh, or 0 0.02 ZT. So what I'll present today is a concept whereby we can take silicon, which in, in its original state is actually a very poor thermoelectric material, and turn it by nanostructuring into an, what we call a nanophononic uh, metamaterial. And in doing so, we actually, uh, in principle, uh, project uh, you know quite quite uh, remarkable uh, increase in ZT. So so this is of course is based on simulations. It's not experimentally validated yet, and it's based on uh, nanostructures that are quite small, on the order of twenty nanometers. So for for practical purposes, of course. We need them to be larger, but at least it shows uh, the potential. So, um, so these are a couple of references where, where we demonstrate how we can uh, essentially project such, such uh, significant increase in, in performance. Um, it's also interesting, I should say, that the trend also tends uh, not only the performance can be quite high with with this uh, with this track with this path, but the but qualitatively it's very different. So you you see that typically. The ZT value increases with temperature because ZT, the T and the ZT is temperature, whereas in, 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 in what we're looking at here is, is something that goes down, and that, that's because of the because as I said earlier, we, we are utilizing wave phenomena, and when you increase the temperature, the scattering increases, so you actually get less of that wave phenomenon. So it's inter interesting from from several uh, perspectives. So what what I'm going to do now for the rest of the talk uh, essentially is two parts. The, the first part is I'll explain how we reach such performance. I'll, I'll, I'll present the MPMs and I'll uh, go through the modeling details and uh, uh, show you results and, and show you also uh, the paths that we found that could potentially take us to, to such high performance. And uh, part of that actually very connected to this is the notion of performance with scale. Because as we know, any, any phenomena that uh, fundamentally uh, that depends on uh, processes and me mechanisms that happen at the nanoscale will be scale dependent. So this is key to the development of, of this concept. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk quite a bit also about how the performance scales. All right, so let's start with, with the first part. Um, and I'm gonna use a few uh, cartoon type schematics just to demonstrate the, the, some of the basic uh, sort of high level uh, uh, ideas there. So if we, to consider a cross section of a membrane and use this symbol to describe phonons. So of course, phonons are traveling, they're carrying heat, they're scattering. And so, as I said earlier, the conventional approach is to introduce these obstacles. So you've got interfaces, you've got holes, you've got inclusions and so on. 
but then again, uh, that intimately or ultimately, I should say, will will uh, impede the electrons as well. Of course, you can you can try to optimize considering the mean free path of electrons versus phonons and somehow find a sweet spot. But still, it's a uh, it's really a a very tight trade off to, to navigate navigate around. Now, so suppose we can now remove these obstacles altogether. So have free reign for, for the electrons. Of course, the question then is how, how are we then gonna reduce the thermal conductivity? And the way we're gonna do this is rather than including scatterers, we will include these structures on the ceiling. So, so sub substructures, resonating substructures, uh, nano pillars, for example, or nano walls. And in fact, these would be the agents that we introduce to, to give us what we want, to, to let us achieve our goal. So what these structures will admit is also phonons, but as I said earlier, uh, we're going to call them vibrons. And that's because unlike phonons, which are wave number dependent, these vibrons are effectively standing waves. So then they're wave number independent. And what these vibrons will do is they will couple with the phonons. So, so it's, it's, it's the same structure that is it's contiguous. So in the steady state, uh, or even in a transient state, you will continuously find uh, uh, phonon vibrant coupling taking place between, uh, between those two uh, elements. And in fact, that's the key uh, <clears throat> phenomena that we utilize to reduce the thermal conductivity. So, uh, and that's what we call an NPM. So I'm gonna now <clears throat> go through uh, a step-by-step -step sort of description of how we go about with the modeling uh, to, to show this uh, phenomena and show how it affects the thermal conductivity. And later on, I'll also touch on uh, the electronic properties as well as some preliminary experimental results to validate uh, these effects. Uh, but I, I wanna quickly show you here this uh, uh, focus article that precisely because of this notion of having an opportunity where you have a pillar uh, on top of a silicon crystal that has no scatterers at all and providing this as a means to uh, obstruct the, the heat transfer. So this in itself was an interesting uh, sort of thought. And uh, we, we, we uh, then had to, of course, examine it much closer to see what's the, what's the obstacles and, and what's the issues and, and so on, what's the underlying challenges. So um, I'm gonna go ahead now and uh, run by you with, with a few slides that just essentially in a very, very simplistic way describes how we've built uh, our models. So again, this is the strip that, um, that we have and it's admitting phonons. Each phonon is described by a wave number so we can construct a, a phonon band structure. In this case, the, the bands are all folded but because it's a model that's a supercell. Um, and we can we can identify the various modes of propagation, transverse waves, longitudinal waves, and so on. However, it's important to note that that wave picture, which is actually a linear uh, harmonic picture, is only uh, uh, an idealization. It, it's useful because it allows us to understand, you know, basic uh, underlying characteristics of how phonons uh, propagate in that medium, but. Uh, but I was, as I was saying earlier, scattering still is still very important. And in this case, I'm talking specifically about phonon phonon scattering. So that that's also a, a part of, of, of that problem. So, so there's really no such thing as a linear version of this problem. And the scattering mechanisms, uh, just just like I was saying earlier, they could be you could have scattering from obstacles and so on. But you can also, and this is very fundamental, you can have uh, you're also having scattering due to phonon phonon interaction. So, so that's uh, characterized by the phonon mean free path. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, and uh, to our, to our uh, benefit, uh, for silicon in specific, the phonon mean free path tends to be quite large. So this provides us with quite a decent window of opportunity to use uh, notions of waves and band structure and so on. Uh, and especially if we can manip manipulate these waves uh, to, to control the thermal transfer because of these uh, large uh, mean free paths. And I'm gonna talk about that more, uh, in more detail shortly. So from the modeling perspective, we will start with, we, we essentially have to uh, model at the atomic scale, I should say, because if we don't, if we, for example, use a continuum uh, model, we lose much of the physics. So, 
So starting at the, at the atomic scale, we're going to take two atoms, which represent a primitive cell in silicon. And we can essentially build our model based on primitive cells. The challenge, though, is that its billion zone is quite complex because the, the primitive, primitive lattice vectors are oblique, are oblique at different angles and so on. So we just take a, a, a small step and uh, instead uh, work with a conventional cell where, where the lattice vectors are all orthogonal. So the, in the reciprocal lattice space, we have a, quite a workable a billion zone, just a cube that we can uh, use as a building block. And you can see here the irreducible billion zone uh, mark in, in this conventional cell. So with that, with that in place, we can put, put those conventional cells together and uh, form a building block. So we will, of course, use an appropriate uh, interatomic potential. In, in, this, in this work, we're using the Stillinger Weber potential. And we'll build a, a, a building block. In this case, we have two by two by two CCs, conventional cells, forming 64 atoms. But we can, we can grow our, our building block. And then we can explore different configurations. So we'll start with bulk. And uh, so that building block, essentially, we take it as is, and we apply uh, block boundary conditions in all three directions. And, and that's, in fact, what I've showed you before. And from there, we have, we have a band structure for, for, our, for our model. And then, obviously, we're interested in the thermal conductivity. So there's different ways to do that. And I'm going to uh, take, take a minute to describe uh, one of the techniques that I think uh, serves a, a very useful purpose in that it's actually, uh, it actually provides us with some insights. So it's not a black box technique like we like some of the other approaches where we just analyze thermal transport using uh, molecular, di molecular dynamic simulations and so on. Here, this is an analytical approach that allows us to predict the thermal conductivity using the Boltzmann transport model, specifically under the relaxation time approximation. So if you look closely, the thermal conductivity K is um, a summation of an integral, integral over the billion zone uh, along the direction of interest. And in the integrand, there is a product of three quantities, the specific heat, and then the groove velocity squared, and then the scattering time constant or the lifetime. Um, so clearly, you can see that all of them are dependent on kappa and, la and, ga and uh, lambda there. So kappa is the wave vector, and lambda is the branch number, uh, as shown there. And if you see, if you look there at the band structure, we have many, many branches, and each branch will, will have a branch number. So uh, important to, 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 to the, what, what you would observe here is, first of all, the, quant the, the, the concept of thermal conductivity is intimately dependent on the phonon band structure. That's number one. And number two, it uh, really uh, is highly affected by this quantity here, the groove velocity squared. Now, of course, we know that the slopes of the dispersion uh, represent the groove velocity. So naturally, you would think, OK, what if we turn this bulk material into a membrane? So if we turn it into a membrane, then uh, we're essentially, because of phonon confinement effects, we're flattening the modes. So this is well known uh, even at the continuum level when we look at plates, for example. So you get a flexural mode and you get shear modes and so on. So non-bulk type uh, modes. So and, and they tend to have lower uh, slopes, so yeah, they have lower groove velocity. So with that approach by itself, by just reducing the dimension, you can reduce the thermal conductivity. However, it's not enough. If you do that, I mean, if you're pursuing high thermoelectric performance. So this is, in fact, where the MPM uh, concept comes into play. So just like I was showing you before in the form of schematics, now we actually have a model shown there on the right, which is an atomic scale model of a membrane with a pillar. And the in the band structure shown there, the phonon band structure, you can see part of it resembles that of a plate because the, the MPM is, in fact, a, 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 a membrane or a plate except that now we have these pillars. And what these pillars do, as I said earlier, they, they form these vibrons. So these are nothing but resonances. Uh, and each atom in that pillar has three degrees of freedom. And for each three degree, degree of freedom, you have a, a, a mode. So imagine having a pillar on the order of, let's say, 20 by 20 or 40 by 40 nanometers in the base, and then uh, maybe 500 nanometers in height. We're already talking millions if not tens of millions of resonances. So all of these resonances play a role. And that's what's unique about uh, the, this uh, uh, nanostructure here. 
And you can see they manifest themselves as straight lines, as horizontal lines, wave, wave number independent uh, uh, lines in the spectrum. And what they do is they couple. And that's what that's the, at the heart of what we're talking about, this, this notion of coupling or avoided crossing, uh, the crossings that takes place between these resonances and the underlying phonon spectrum. So, so in, do, in doing so, you get reductions in the slopes and you get reductions in the group velocities. And not only uh, you get it in a certain frequency range, but you in fact get it across the whole spectrum because you get a lot of these, as I said, because you have millions of them. Um, so that's really the, 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 the main mechanism that, that we're utilizing. And uh, now I'm gonna sort of dive a little deeper and show you how this uh, unfolds. So this is a picture of the phonon band structure with a little bit more detail, showing you in green the MPM modes on the left, and then uh, the original, uh, so in the membrane without pillars is, is in red, and then the MPM in, in green. And in that circle, you can see these hybridization zones where the coupling takes place and the avoided crossing takes place. And then on the right, which is uh, most interesting, is what happens to the group velocity. So you can see that on, on, on collectively, the group velocities drop significantly across, across the, the entire spectrum. In fact, we're showing here only 0.5 terahertz, but for silicon, this phenomena extends to uh, up to 17 terahertz. So the group velocity is reduced. So you can see there on the bottom. So that's one effect. But then the other effect is we're adding these additional uh, atoms. So we're adding to that summation on the left, right? But these atoms that, uh, that uh, contribute modes that are flat, so they're, they're effectively adding almost zero group velocity. And at the end, we're dividing by V. And I, I, I should have mentioned this earlier because we're, thermal conductivity is an intrinsic property. So you get this localization effect where the energy gets localized in the modes, in the pillars, I'm sorry. And because of that, you get even yet another mechanism that contributes to the thermal conductivity. So you can see here, uh, uh, you know, at, at this hybridization region, uh, there, this one here is a membrane mode, and you can see the atoms moving, whereas exactly the same uh, membrane, but now we have the pillars. You see all the motion localized in the pillars, and almost zero motion um, in the base. So this is a very interesting phenomenon to realize something like that at the atomic scale. All right, so this is just a video to show you what I've just shown you in, in, a, in a static picture. So this is a, a standard mode, and then that same mode because is rendered totally uh, stationary, totally localized uh, because of, uh, of that uh, 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 local resonance uh, coupling effect. So atoms in standstill state in the base membrane. So these were the two main mechanisms, but I should also say there's a third one and, uh, and that's to do with the, the, the phonon phonon scattering and also any, any boundary scattering that might arise in, on the surfaces of the membrane. So just to show you uh, how, how uh, th this uh, manifests, uh, we have here uh, adopted uh, a technique called the spectral energy density uh, method, whereby unlike before, we, we, do, we conduct a molecular dynamic simulation and we use the, the velocity fields from the simulation and effectively apply a space-time Fourier transform. And in doing so, we can get the, the in the frequency domain we can get the properties of, of these uh, phonons. And, and unlike the previous work where we have to, with the, with the transport model, where we have to make assumptions on the scattering constants or maybe curve fit them from experiments, here it's all happening dynamically uh, based on our choice of interatomic potential. So you can see here in this picture, we, we, have, we, we, we track that line of phonons here. You see, these are the group velocities. This is the lifetimes and they drop a bit as well as the mean free path, you can get the mean free path by uh, from the lifetimes using the group velocity. So they drop a bit, and and that's shown there in their in the in the in the quality factor of the, of the of the uh, resonances associated with each of those phonons. Um, however, as long as this is done in moderation, it in principle it should be fine. It should not undermine the very uh, wave effects that we are utilizing. And and to check that we can actually plot the, 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 from the spectral energy density, we can actually plot the dispersion. So you can see it resembles for a pure membrane that resembles the one that we get in the left there. The one that we have in the left is just from harmonic lattice dynamics calculations. It matches perfectly, which tells us 
that these, even in the presence of phonon phonon scattering in a, in a room temperature uh, MD environment, we, we have these uh, dispersion characteristics. And more, more importantly, once we add a pillar, we actually see the resonance modes. We see these localized modes. And, and that was a very important uh, confirmation for us that this is not just a, a phenomena that uh, inspired by acoustics that takes place when we, when we look at a linearized eigenvalue problem, but it actually happens in, in the context of uh, a full-fledged uh, anharmonic MD simulation. Okay, so uh, that takes care of the first part, which is uh, essentially how we, we reach this performance. We reach this performance uh, by uh, these, these introducing these nano resonators that couple with, with the phonons and reduce their speeds, localize and so on, reduce the thermal conductivity. Uh, and hopefully, uh, and that's what we're, I'll, I'll address in a bit, this can may all happen without affecting the electrical properties. So uh, this takes, takes me now to the second part, which is what happens with scale. And in fact, that's also key to, to uh, the other properties for, for the ZT figure of matter. So there um, we need to look at this scale issue from two perspectives. There, there's two aspects to it. One of them is I've touched on earlier, which is to do with the phonon mean free path. So I want to dwell on that a little more. So this paper here out of uh, uh, Gangsheng's group from MIT back in 2011 is a very, very useful study based on first principles that gives you, uh, for silicon at room temperature, gives you a distribution, not just of the wavelengths, but also of the mean free paths. And you can see uh, the, the, the distribution is quite broad for the mean free path. So for example, that green line is at one micron and it's roughly two thirds of the thermal conductivity. So that's quite remarkable. It tells you that you still have almost one third of the thermal conductivity contributed to by uh, phonons that are uh, by, by mean free paths that are larger than a micron. So really what this suggests is that the mean free path for silicon is quite large. And this is, this is the, the key advantage that I mentioned earlier. So if we were to draw a circle representing uh, the, mean, the, the phonon mean free path, and we can get that uh, uh, and we can relate it to the, to the life, lifetime as I mentioned earlier. If we were to draw a circle that represents the average and draw it within our, you know, a unit cell of our uh, pillared membrane, our MPM, if this circle happens to be small compared to the feature sizes, then in principle, these, feature si these features are irrelevant. So we're, we're still talking about bulk silicon, except a huge sample of bulk silicon. Now, on the other hand, if we were to design the feature features such that they are within that uh, circle, then we are effectively changing the material altogether. So now we have nano silicon, and this is key to realizing the, the phonon vibrant effects that I talked about. So that's, that's one aspect uh, to it, the, the notion of the mean free path. The second aspect is, is equally as important, um, and that's what we call the phonon vibrant conformity. So let, let me try to explain this. So if we take our unit cell, which is a membrane with a pillar attached on the top, and dissect it. So we turn it into a membrane portion and a pillar portion, all right? And then if we were to calculate the density of states for, for each of those components, uh, this is what we get here. So, so in, in red, we have the phonon density of states. It's, it's a familiar distribution if you're, if you're familiar with, with bulk silicon, because it looks very, looks quite similar to, to that of bulk silicon, uh, even though it's a membrane. And then we have in blue the density of states for uh, the vibrons, the, the phonons in the pillar, the standing, the standing phonons. Immediately, you'll see that they're not conforming. I mean, they look very differently. And um, in fact, that's that's not a that's not a good uh, outcome because the very effect that we're utilizing depends on the coupling being high, and for the coupling to be high, you, you would want that de these density of states to be matching, to be conforming. So we explored this aspect qu quite a bit. Uh, so what the first thing we've done is we took that unit cell and uh, enlarged it proportionally. So we enlarged the pillar and the membrane proportionally, and we defined a quantity, a metric, VR, which is basically the volume of the pillar com compared to the volume of the base. And so when you enlarge everything proportionally, effectively, you're keeping VR constant. And what we saw, and we basically quantified that conformity, you know, using, dot using uh, some algorithm. And this R quantity here 
uh, quantifies that uh, the, the reciprocal of that uh, conformity. So the the larger the, no, the the larger the number, the less conforming the, the two density of states are. So in fact, that was quite a setback because you see, as we uh, as we increase the, the the unit cell size proportionally, we lose that con con conformity. Um, so we worked on it quite a bit because it, it was it was not a very encouraging piece of news, uh, at least temporarily, because it would suggest that we can't scale this uh, concept up. However, uh, I should say uh, happily, we were able to find that if we, on the other hand, uh, rather than expand or grow the size, and when I say grow, I mean in our mind, conceptually, in our models, rather than grow, grow the size of the unit cell proportionally, if we were to grow the pillar part at a higher rate than the base membrane part, so the VR gets larger, the volume fraction, so what we call vibrant compensation. So we're compensating with more and more vibrance as we scale up. If we do that, we found the result to be quite remarkable. We found that, in fact, the two density of states match perfectly at some point once we grow the pillar size compared to the membrane uh, enough. And that opened up now the opportunity that we can scale up while also optimizing uh, the performance. So this was a really important milestone for, for, for this uh, research. So now if we were to take this aspect uh, and, and, and explore it a little deeper, we can, for example, quantify, formally quantify what happens to the group velocities. So this is the entire spectrum up to around 17 terahertz. And what this figure shows is an average quantity that represents uh, the ratio of the NPM group velocity to that of uh, a pure membrane. So we want that uh, quantity to be as low as possible. And in fact, we can see indeed that as we uh, engage in this vibrant compensation uh, pro uh, methodology or approach, we reduce the average group velocity. So that, that's favorable and that suggests that we are going to get uh, you know, stronger uh, reductions in the thermal conductivity. Now, remember, there was also the second mechanism, which is the mode localization. So similarly, using dot products uh, uh, between the modes and, uh, and so on, we can quantify uh, what we call uh, a mode weight factor, a metric that describes the extent of mode localization. And so it's described there on the, shown there on the right. And what it tells us is that if this metric gets lower, then it implies stronger and stronger uh, localization of uh, motion in the modes, in the, in the pillars, I'm sorry. And this is in fact the, the second mechanism that we depend on. So we want this localization to be as strong as possible. And indeed we find with this vibrant compensation that the localization improves. So these two things uh, or these two observations of, uh, that came about through this approach of uh, increasing the pillar size at a higher rate has now opened for us uh, or paved the way to, to really reach high performance. So now we, we, we went, went ahead and, and calculated or uh, through simulations, MD simulations, and followed by the green Kubo method, which, uh, which is a statistical method, methods technique that allows us to predict the thermal conductivity uh, from uh, MD uh, simulations. We were able to show that uh, as we increase the membrane thickness and according and as, as we do that, we increase the pillar at a higher rate, as I, as I was explaining. If we were to engage a very tall pillar on the order of uh, you know, aspect ratio of 60, we get very strong thermal conductivity reduction. So compared to a pure membrane, we get roughly uh, uh, 50 times reduction. And then if we were to add pillars on both sides, we actually found that we can get two orders of magnitude reduction. So this is a very significant uh, reduction in the thermal conductivity. Now, in the context of that system here, the membrane there is roughly 20 nanometers thick. Uh, the pillar is roughly uh, half a micron. In this context, we were able to see in the literature that uh, there are several results that report that for a uh, feature size of 20 nanometers or so, the electronic properties are not that much affected. So on that basis, and given that the electronic part of the thermal conductivity for silicon is quite low compared to the thermal or the lattice part, the part that we are manipulating, we were able to make a projection of a ZT value of above three. So that, of course, would be a record value. And that's the value that I, I mentioned to you earlier. Now, of course, 
we would need to uh, go, you know, do more in-depth, uh, you know, analysis and, 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 in fact, go ahead and predict the, these properties. Uh, first, first of all, using uh, you know, app initial calculations, which we're working on right now, and then most importantly, of course, uh, validate by experiments. So I'm going to talk a bit about our some preliminary results we have on those two tracks. Tracks. Um, so we looked at some uh, NPMs and uh, obtained, uh, uh, so we've got the phonon band structure, but we also were able to obtain the electronic band structure. So shown there in black is bulk, then underneath it is membrane, uh, uh, and then a membrane with uh, some pillar. And you can see that the electronic structure hardly changes by adding the pillar. And even if we add larger height, it, it hardly changes. So that was, this in itself is a positive indication. And furthermore, if we were to plot the charge density, we're already seeing that uh, there's not much effect by adding the pillar. So this is ongoing work with uh, uh, Hasnip's group in uh, York and England. And then in another, uh, on another parallel track with, with my colleague, uh, Chris Burton is from NIST next door here in Boulder. We've been fabricating some structures. So this is gallium nitride grown on silicon membranes using uh, molecular beam epitaxy. And uh, we have some preliminary results there as well showing that the thermal conductivity as we predict uh, is, is, is going down with increase in nanopillar height. Now the reduction here is 25 degrees only, but that's because we didn't attempt to optimize that system. This was just a, a proof of concept. Uh, an actual next step of course, is to turn this into a device. So uh, I, I had the opportunity of working with some colleagues here in the Boulder and nearby area from NIST and uh, CU My uh, Colorado School of Mines under an ARPA-E grant to essentially turn this into a device. So this is also, while we're further investigating the the, the concept at the material level, we're also working and putting the first, uh, you know, putting the foundations for, for a device. I want to then take a couple of minutes to contrast uh, how, because everything I've mentioned so far is nanophonic metamaterials, these membranes with pillars. It would be interesting to contrast it with another nanostructured material that has gained a lot of interest, which is what folks call uh, nanophonic crystals. So essentially, instead of putting a pillar, you introduce a hole. So this hole, while it can provide some scattering, but it also primarily can give you Bragg scattering, so coherent effects. And that also reduces the group velocities, but not definitely not as effective uh, as the pillar, because the pillar provides you with an opportunity to feed in, as you add more height, to feed in more, uh, more effect through these couplings. So to test this, we we're showing you here from simulations, uh, thermal conductivity reduction uh, compared to a base membrane versus how much area coverage of hole or pillar, if you look at the, from the top, we, we add to, to a base membrane. So you see in red is a membrane with a short pillar and orange, slightly larger pillar. And then in blue, we have this MPC with a hole. And you can see as we increase the height of the pillar, we get further reduction if you, if you look downwards, but the MPC eventually outperforms because it, uh, it has that hole. However, once we go to a much higher pillar, we actually outperform the MPC. And that's because of the reason I mentioned. And in fact, you can see that uh, for an area coverage of roughly 79%, with an NPM, we get 0.9% uh, thermal conductivity compared to the base membrane, whereas uh, for the phononic crystal, 1.5%. And if you if you look at that green line for the same thermal conductivity reduction, you can actually achieve this with an NPM. We go to the left with a much lower uh, coverage. So, so that was a study that we've done. Now I want to take a few minutes before I wrap up to sort of like take a step back and uh, share with you uh, why we call this a metamaterial, especially that, of course, the notion of a metamaterial is, is well established and uh, highly um, pursued for the control of electromagnetic waves. Uh, you know, we're all familiar, uh, a lot of us would be familiar with, with these early studies uh, that utilizes split ring resonators. And in analogy, of course, there is also the acoustic metamaterial concept whereby you have these resonators in the form of resonating uh, inclusions. So what we're uh, providing now is in, is in fact a yet another analogy. So this is this would be uh, a, a metamaterial for the control of heat. And as I've explained throughout the talk, 
you can immediately, uh, if, if you're familiar with the, with the more classical metamaterials, you can immediately see a wide range of differences. So for example, uh, where the classical ones utilize one or few uh, resonances, here we're utilizing millions of resonances, whereas in a classical metamaterial, you're mostly interested in the sub-wavelength regime. Here we're interested in the entire spectrum. And uh, in, in classical uh, metamaterials, you're typically interested in effective properties uh, because of these uh, sub-wavelength uh, resonances. Uh, here, we really uh, are, are not necessarily interested in, in any effective medium theory. So uh, applications, of course, are different. Uh, typically, uh, electromagnetic and acoustic metamaterials are used for imaging, focusing, cloaking, and so on, where here we're using it for thermoelectric energy conversion. I should say, in principle, we can use it for other applications that utilize uh, many, that can benefit from uh, man uh, manipulating thermal con conduction at the nanoscale. And then, uh, even more can be said about the use of the term meta. So I have further uh, cartoons here to show you. Im imagine this picture that I showed you before. I mean, now I'm showing some rough surfaces. So you have less material by adding some holes. So if you have less material, well, it's well known that if you have more holes, you will reduce the thermal conductivity more and vice versa. So typically you, you live in this uh, trade-off. Uh, and then uh, similarly, if you add scatterers, to impede the phonons, well, you can also draw a similar picture and recognize that you increase the thermal conductivity reduction by uh, reducing the scatter. So you get this uh, trade-off as well. So if we take those two trade-offs and then look at what we're, we're able to achieve with an MPM is in fact, we're able to get outside this trade-off, penetrate uh, into, into what we can call a metaspace because we were able to reduce the thermal conductivity further by rather than adding holes, we were adding material, these pillars, and we're able to reduce the thermal conductivity by in fact not adding any scatterers at all. So that's yet another sort of like uh, comment that I, I like to share about the notion of meta. Uh, finally, since we proposed this in 2014, a few really creative ideas emerged for other types of MPMs. So for example, wires with, with pillars on both sides, so again, the resonance hybridization phenomena was identified and shown and the localization as well and shown how it affects and reduces the thermal conductivity. Um, this group from, from China produced the same effect using spiral uh, patterns. So these spiral patterns act as the resonators and they also have the same effect. You can see here the hybridization effect, the, the vibrant phonon coupling. Uh, also in the bulk scale. So this, this group there uh, examined a bulk system whereby you have these networks and these networks act as resonators. And once again, you can see the, the resonances and their couplings. And they've shown also that this reduces the thermal conductivity. And from Illinois, they, they've shown that if you introduce a resonator in the form of actually amorphous uh, silicon, so the, there's resonances among the amorphous region, which itself, uh, also uh, uh, produced the same phenomena and gave you these, these uh, hybridizations or at least these local resonances. Um, in fact, even, even other type of materials like graphene and carbon nanotubes. So this group there shown that you can have a nano ribbon with legs of, of graphene, nano ribbon of graphene with legs extruding. And again, you see that, that same effect there in the dispersion. And uh, from Virginia, they have buckyballs uh, distributed over a carbon nanotube, and these buckyballs produce the resonances, and the same group realized the same idea with buckyballs and graphene, and again, you can see the resonances. And there's more as well. So it's really, uh, it really opens up a, a lot of opportunities in different materials to, to achieve this very uh, interesting and uh, useful phenomenon. So I'm sorry I had to uh, speed up a little because I'm mindful of the time and I wanted to leave some time for Q&A, but this is my summary slide. So we have this notion of a MPM that um, what is unique about it is that it utilizes resonances in the full spectrum. As I said, practically millions of resonances. And it allows us to, in a way, uh, really transform the, the, the very uh, um, character of, of thermal transport at the, or thermal conduction at the nanoscale. It becomes, becomes essentially a resonant dominated thermal transport. Um, and we've shown that this is very different than the conventional mechanisms of electromagnetic and acoustic metamaterials. 
And with some projections, we are targeting uh, high performance in, in, in the area of thermoelectrics with this, with this configuration. And then finally, these are um, some references that uh, I invite you to look at uh, that we produced over the years, including the handbook chapter there at the bottom. And specifically this one here uh, in advanced functional materials, this was a review article that appeared uh, last year uh, on thermal transport, energy conversion and storage. That was the theme and we have our uh, review article there that uh, has more information. So with that, thank you, Alessandro. Uh, that, that's uh, all I had uh, for, for my talk and I'd be happy to answer uh, any, any questions. Thank you, thank you so much, Mahmoud. That was really, really interesting, really neat idea. It was nice seeing the, how this field that eventually is, uh, I mean, it's picking up. There are several works now based on this concept. So it's really great to, to be talking to you that you kind of you know, pioneered this idea. And uh, uh, well, of course now that everybody can ask any questions and feel free just to type it or I can give you the word when you like. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, actually, yeah, yeah, of course I have a bunch of questions. This is really interesting and, and really promising. So one thing is, uh, well, first of all, what, what do you think it is from the, from the practical point of view? So what are the main challenges in actually realizing this kind of materials? Because, you know, silicon, I mean, it has been, it's been around uh, for, for a long time. So I guess that the nanofabrication techniques are quite advanced. So what's the particular challenge in uh, like fabricating specifically these nanophononic materials? So they're, they're of course uh, producing uh, uh, what we can consider, I think fairly consider a sophisticated, a relatively sophisticated nanostructure is even though, as you say, nanofab has developed greatly uh, and we're working with, with NIST on this, but it's still challenging uh, in, in the sense that you need to have precision, a good, a good level of precision, especially in the resonators, because you want the resonators to exhibit these vibrons and provide an environment where the vibrons can travel and engage with the phonons. So you don't want any scattering to happen uh, in principle in, in the pillar. So that's, that's a challenge. You, you need you know, smooth surfaces in the resonators. Um, from, a, from the perspective of impurities. Now, of course, uh, we, we would want to uh, find, you know, uh, high quality, uh, you know, silicon. And then, and then the next challenge is to integrating this into a device, you know, take, taking a, you know, a step uh, back and, and looking at this from an engineering perspective. So beyond the physics, how do you actually, uh, you know, engineer the thermal packaging and uh, sort of like optimize and maximize both the electrical properties and the thermal properties from a device perspective. So that would be the next level. Okay. And um, so is there any any questions from the from the public? Because I mean, me and Professor were saying we will have time to discuss. So I want to leave some also some space to, to other people. Uh, is there anyone that wants to scan anything? No, I, I had a question. Really, really nice talk. And I'm looking forward to discussing later this afternoon. Um, kind of maybe building on Alessandro's question, is it possible to test the predictions of these theories uh, using ultrasonic, so lower frequency acoustic waves with larger scale structures that are perhaps easier to, easier to fabricate experimentally? So actually that has been done. So I, I should say that uh, in, the, in the parallel uh, you know, field or the other part of the community uh, that, that uh, is, is more interested in lower frequencies, acoustic type applications, ultrasonic applications, and so on. Uh, folks have examined uh, plate type structures with, with pillar uh, configurations, and they've shown that the, the, you know, the resonances exist and they hybridize them. But of course, remember, this is when, when you go to larger scales, it's much easier to measure. It's, there's less factors to influence the problem. You can practically model the problem as a linear problem. So you see these uh, wave features very cleanly. The challenge, of course, is when once you go down to, to the small scale, very, very small scale, I should say, the, the nano scale, um, we get all these uh, challenges that I mentioned. You know, you, you've got to be mindful of the size. 
because of the mean free path and you've got to be mindful of uh, quality of, of uh, samples and so on. I see, yeah, it makes sense. And then one maybe related question is it, um, are the resonances and the hybridization sensitive to the perfect periodicity of the unit cell or to kind of surface roughness effects either on the pillars or on the membrane? Oh, or that's, it... a, that's an excellent question. So, uh, so the first part is no, and that's one yet another advantage of, of this uh, approach in the, in the sense that the resonance is actually unlike, unlike in phononic crystals where we have periodic holes, you fundamentally depend on the periodicity. The resonances, on the other hand, you're not dependent on the periodicity. Now, of course, typically we model them as periodic configurations because it's easy to, to analyze using Bloch's theorem and get a dispersion diagram and so on. But in principle, they don't need to be periodic. So that's yet another element of robustness for, for, for this approach. The, the, second, uh, the second question regarding roughness. So as I mentioned, roughness is key uh, for the pillars themselves, you want the pillars to be pristine as much as possible, the surfaces, because you want to enable uh, the vibrance to travel and reach the, 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 the base, the root. Whereas on the other hand, in the membrane itself, in principle, you don't really need to have uh, rough surfaces. And that's because uh, once the vibrance travel in, they will do their job. And in fact, on top of that, you can get further uh, phonon uh, suppression by by conventional, uh, you know, scattering mechanisms through the surface and so on. So, if anything, it'll be an additive effect when you have rough surfaces in the membrane. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Joel. So I was actually about to ask him the same question about the periodicity. So it's, uh, but yeah, it makes sense. In this case, it doesn't really matter, uh, like the precision with which you. You place the you place the pillars uh, re regarding the 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 filling fraction that you have uh, of the there was a slide where basically it's kind of different from this cover that you're putting up here. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I had the impression one of the slides that the actual uh, let's say covered area by the pillars on top of the on the membrane was pretty large. Yeah, is that, is that the case? Indeed. I mean, as I was saying, uh, so this picture really, uh, I think, answers your, your uh, query right. here, yeah. Alessandro. So as we increase the coverage area, that's, the, that's exactly the x-axis. So the x-axis, whether we're looking at the hole or a pillar, if we look from the top, that's the width of whether, it's, whether, whether we're looking at the hole or a pillar. So the entire, the entire size is roughly 18 conventional cells. And we have the biggest size possible here is 16. So this is almost fully covered from the top by pillars. So you don't you have extremely small, uh, you know, distances between the pillars, and that's where you get the strongest reduction, as I was explaining earlier, because you get more resonances and you get more of the effect. Okay, I guess my question here is, uh, uh, but what if you? I mean, if at some point if you go too far, you just fill everything and you go back to the body material. Yeah. Right. So there is, there's going to be like a, a very steep transition at some point where you're if, if they touch, it, indeed, if they touch each other. So you want to stop where you guarantee that they don't touch each other. Okay. So but yeah, I was thinking point. about maybe some. I mean, I'm not experimentalist, but maybe some fabrication method that works in reverse, where basically you start from a slab and you try to basically, I don't know, to cut some slates. That's true. Yeah. And, in fact, that's that's also another approach that uh, uh, you know our collaborators are uh, pursuing, which is etching through. And the challenge there is that you want to ma ma make the the distances as small as possible. That's uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so we we are ending the 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 seminar hour. Uh, so of course I'm thanking everyone for taking the time to listen to this uh, really great talk. Thanks. Thanks again to Professor Hussain uh, for the beautiful presentation. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Bye, Joe. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye.